The equity bulls are getting it their way, that's for sure right now. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. PPI downside surprise, equity market higher, much higher. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. For how long can investors dream? The key issue at the moment is the sequencing of hitting the Fed's dual mandate. So the sequencing happens to be in the right way for markets, namely first inflation is coming down. We have seen now inflation come down from the peak in June without an increase in the unemployment rate. Looking for a sweet spot between inflation rolling over and growth getting smashed. City Stuart Kaiser saying time is running out. The investable windows are really, really short. It's the window between, hey, inflation looks like it's peaked, the Fed can back off on rate hikes, and uh-oh, you know, the unemployment rate is rising and other, other forms of economic growth are slowing. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson putting an end date on that dream, bracing for the growth shock to hit in Q1. The earnings forecast for next year are substantially too high. That process of readjusting those estimates will begin in the fourth quarter reporting season because that's when companies will have to address 2023 forecast, which they haven't done yet. And that's the catalyst. It's basically the slowdown uh, that will hit earnings significantly next year. Joining us right now to discuss is Bank of America's Jared Woodard and Exonix Peter Cicchini. Jared, I want to begin with you and go to that quote from Stuart Kaiser over at Citi. That sweet spot for markets. Timing matters for markets, he said. Would inflation crest before growth deteriorates and let the FOMC deal with those risks to its mandate separately? For markets, how long an investable window is there between those two waves of economic risks? Can you walk us through that, Jared? How wide do you think that window is? I think it's a very narrow window, John, for investors to try to take some sort of tactical uh, bullish trade. Really, right now, the big risk for, though, that we see is that the, the lags between monetary policy tightening and the effects in the real economy could be much longer than investors have priced in. Think about the, 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 the mortgage market in the United States. Something like 90 or 95 percent of mortgages in the U.S. are fixed versus only two-thirds in the rest of the world. That means monetary policy is biting harder elsewhere, not here. The United States also only has, you know, is the only place where you saw massive fiscal stimulus, trillion dollars on the balance sheets of U.S. households in excess of historical norms. That means that rate hikes take longer to hit harder because of all that excess consumer cash. And I think you're, you're going to see a, a big lag, and that means it's going to be very difficult for markets to digest both slowing growth and tighter financial conditions at the same time. So, Jared, would you fade the move on the screen at the moment? Equity futures at 1.8% on the S&P, up much, much more on the Nasdaq. Absolutely. John, we think this is a structural shift we're in the very middle of, very early innings of, really, between the 2% world of the past two decades, 2% real GDP growth, 2% inflation targets. If you look at the, the broader 20th century, 5% was more than norm. In that shift from 2 to 5%, from... From, from growth stocks to value stocks, from, from atoms to bits, you know, from, from digital to real. It's very early days, and we would use rallies like this within a bear market to take profits in growth, take profits in long-term treasuries, and rotate back to the inflation-friendly uh, uh, types of trades. Pete, do you agree? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Jared on this. Um, you know, he referred to it as a structural shift. Um, we've referred to it as a, a regime shift. And I, and I agree with it. You know, investors over, over a 40-year-plus period have become quite used to that secular downtrend uh, in both short and long rates, which uh, was finally met with a thud at the zero bound. Um, the, the other challenge that the Fed now faces is once it's done combating inflation, wherever that terminal rate ends up, whether it's 4 percent or higher, 5 percent, um, it will struggle with its ability to use a shock and awe strategy um, to get us out of whatever recession we're in at that point. And that's something that the Fed has been, you know, pulling out of its playbook again for 40 years. So I, I agree with that. It is a, it is a regime change. Um, monetary policy um, is not what it was uh, throughout most of that 40-year period. People got used to Goldilocks, and I think that's a thing of the past. I think active investing is uh, going to do a lot better in an environment 
where monetary policy is in a persistent tailwind. When it comes to the chance of the Goldilocks, I think most people agree with you. According to the Bank of America Fund Manager survey, stagflation fears were 92 percent of the feedback in this survey. 92 percent. An overwhelming consensus in this survey. Nobody thinks Goldilocks is coming. Katie Lines has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Yeah, the title of this survey is Stagflation. It's so hot right now because, as you just said, pretty much everyone thinks it's coming next year. And actually, 77% of respondents in this month's fund manager survey think a global recession is coming. And as a result, sentiment is what Bank of America describes as still, quote, uber bearish. As for how that's reflected in allocation, investors are the most overweight cash and most underweight equities, with tech allocation actually the lowest level since 2006. And for the fifth straight month in a row, long U.S. dollars is the most crowded trade. 72% of investors say that the dollar is overvalued, which is the most on record. And then for the other crowded trades, you have number two, short China stocks, number three, long oil, followed by short European equities and long ESG assets. And finally, as we do every month, when you round it out, looking at the biggest tail risks, inflation staying high remains number one. 32% of people gave that answer. And then the next three actually all are tied. Geopolitics worsening, hawkish central banks, and a deep global recession each getting 18%. One could argue all of those things are really tied together. And then rounding out the list, a systemic credit event. But really, John, the takeaway of this survey is pretty much everyone sees stagflation coming. Stagflation, so hot right now. Katie, thank you. Their title, as Katie mentioned a few times. Stagflation then, below trend growth, above trend inflation, the overwhelmingly consensus view in the fund manager survey at 92%. No one thinks Goldilocks. Peter, when you hear that, does that make you uncomfortable? given the overwhelming size of the consensus going into 23? It most certainly does. Um, you know, the, the, the broader the consensus, the more likely one is to be wrong. That's been my experience um, over my investing career. That said, th this is one of the reasons why you see the kinds of rallies we've seen uh, over the past, you know, week and change. Um, we noted in mid-October, in fact, that uh, breadth uh, across indices, but in particular on the NYSE and the S&P, um, was about three standard deviations uh, below its, uh, it, its trend line. And that got us actually tactically construction, constructive in, in mid-October, and we've actually been lightly uh, to not hedged at all since then. Um, but that's a tactical view within the more strategic view, um, which I do think, uh, despite the fact that its consensus will be correct, things are going to get worse from here. Jared, you understand this survey better than most because you used to help put it together at B of A. I'll go through those numbers again for you. I'm sure you've read it. Stagflation, the overwhelmingly consensus view at 92%. Nobody thinks Goldilocks in a fund manager survey. When you hear stuff like that, Jared, in that survey that the team conducts over at B of A, how do you use that information? Well, it's still a fantastic piece of work, John, even though I'm not involved. Thank you for <laughs> highlighting it. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, a, a very important uh, truth that's revealed there, which is that investment professionals understand the shift that's taking place. I think that the big warning from, from my mind is that it's, it's, this is not a time to get too cute. It's not a time to be too contrarian too quickly, because if we're right that we're under you know, the very early stages of a big macroeconomic shift, then the valuation reset could be substantial and it could be prolonged. We wrote a report recently about the nifty 50 stocks in the 1970s, which had very similar both macro and investment profiles to today. Investors had piled into these very expensive, uh, seemingly high quality um, growth stocks. Valuations were sky high. The macro turned and the inflation that the Fed had to fight was very serious. And you saw valuations reset over the course of many years, not, not months, not quarters. And anyone who you know, stepped in front of that freight train of a great valuation reset uh, got burned. And I think that that's the environment that investors have to contend with today, two decades. $70 trillion of assets invested for a 2% world. How many analysts, how many investors have reset their valuation models, their discounted cash flow frameworks for a world with higher interest rates, higher cost of debt, higher rollovers in the bond market? And if you do those resets, you reset those models, I think you get very different valuations of where the market is today. It's not a time to, to fade uh, what could be a major structural shift. Uh, Jared, this is huge. So let's go deeper. You've gone there a few times now. I've been asking a question. Are we unwinding the excess of the last couple of years post-pandemic or the excess of the last 10 years plus? I hear from you it's the last 10 years plus. 
Not many people share that view at the moment, Jared. And as you point out, that's going to have profound implications for how we value the market if Fed fund stays at 4 5%. Let's say even if it stays in at around 35 that's a major change from 10 years ago. Can you run me through, Jared, the challenges to the index level passive investing of the last decade? What those challenges will look like in the years to come, given the weightings of growth equities like big tech? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the conclusion, the big investment impact here is a, is a rotation from the winners of the past two decades, which were tech stocks, consumer discretionary, think about Amazon, uh, um, um, communications, these growth stocks that did so well in a world of record low inflation, record low interest rates, you know, high globalization, uh, deflationary demographics, those secular trends are all reversing, onshoring globalization. Demographics, now inflationary. And you don't have the kind of tech disruptions that are sweeping across the economy that you did over the past 20 years. That means that those, you know, growth sector winners, I think, become the losers of the, of the future. And who picks up the slack? Who's the new leadership? Most likely, from our view, the real economy sectors, like industrials, uh, energy, materials, maybe financials, uh, lending into those those companies. These these sectors, by the way, if you look back at history, it wasn't that long ago that these sectors accounted for more than half of the market cap of the S and P 500. Uh, they've they've since retreated to about 10 percent. I think they could regain that leadership in the years to come. Dare I say the leadership then may come abroad as well? What's your view on that, Jared? Well, look, it's a lot of challenges in the developed world. Um, our, our, our economists expect a recession in Europe next year. Japan still sort of struggling along. But if you look at emerging markets, especially emerging markets ex-China, even China on a very tactical basis, very nimble basis, there's some reasons to be more optimistic. So I think it's very fair to say that given how ahead of the curve emerging market central banks have been and central banks around the rest of the world globally, you may see a period over the next 12 months in which certain countries, certain markets, uh, actually outpace the U.S. in terms of moving through this bear market and onto the other side. Pete, final word here, please. Yeah, no, I, I think it is a new investment paradigm, and I think there's uh, there's going to be plenty of opportunity uh, in what we do, which is structured products, uh, and in particular, I think the levered loan market um, is at risk here uh, with this alongside this interest rate reset. When you look at when you look at the uh, the names in the speculative grade loan index. About 45% of them are actually less than one-time coverage. That's where the opportunity is going to come, smaller companies and value. It's a gloomy conversation relative to what's on the screen. The S&P up by 1.8%. The Nasdaq absolutely ripping. Jared and Pete are going to stick with us. The S&P 500 up by around about 71 points right now. Coming up on this program, President Biden making his rounds at the G20. I'm convinced we're going to come out of this crisis we've been through in the pandemic and other things stronger than we went in. That conversation, I'm next. I'm convinced we're going to come out of this crisis we've been through in the pandemic and other things stronger than we went in. Every time we engage, we get better. And uh, I, uh, today we're focused on investing together and investing stronger than we have in the past. President Biden meeting with world leaders at the G20 summit in Bali. His predecessor, Donald Trump, gearing up for another run at the White House, despite disappointing midterms, weakening his case for the Republican ticket. Really do hope that President Trump sees the writing on the wall. He lost in 2020. We lost Georgia because of his behavior in the Senate race in 2020. That's a second loss. And then this year, the Republicans lost the Senate because the Trump-backed candidates in the Senate races were rejected by American voters. That's a three-time loser. And I'd like to think that the Republican Party is ready to move on from somebody who's been, for this party, a three-time loser. Team coverage starts right now with Anne-Marie joining us from Bali. Emily Wilkins down in Washington, D.C. Emily, first to you, what can we expect from the former president later this evening? Well, we are expecting Trump to announce that he will be running for president in 2024. Uh, certainly, he still has a good amount of support within the Republican Party, but you are seeing party officials, folks in Congress, other Republican groups start to raise concerns and say, hey, this is a guy who has lost three times for us now. We need to start finding someone else. And you've also seen that in the halls of Congress here. You heard uh, several Congress members say that they're a little hesitant on Trump right now. They want someone who can make sure 
that can deliver for the White House as well as Congress. And after Tuesday's really disappointing elections for Republicans, they didn't get nearly as many seats as they thought. They're not going to control the Senate, and they're only going to be able to control the House by such a small uh, majority. And so that really is going to leave them looking for someone else in 2024. Of course, putting Trump now back in the spotlight means that we're going to have to start following him again, watching what he says. And some Republicans, they're just not ready at this point to sort of be responding to every single thing that Trump says and sort of contrasting their opinions against uh, some of Trump's more controversial statements. AMH, you've been following the current president. We talked about this a little bit earlier this morning. The president left the United States a happier man. Is he going to return even happier? He certainly is, Jonathan, when you see that the, the Democrats have now retained control of the Senate, regardless of what happens December 6th in uh, Georgia. And Jonathan, I have to say, that's really on display here in Bali. Well, I spoke to Admiral Kirby, and he says the president has the wind in his back. I just spoke with the president's uh, deputy national security advisor, Mike Pyle. He didn't want to delve too much into politics because he's an economics guy, but he said what foreign leaders see in the United States right now is a resilient economy, and the strength that President Biden has now, off the heels of these midterm elections, is the fact that they are now willing to listen to him, especially with open ears and open arms. And a third conversation I had was with the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. And I said to her, at the same time, you have a number of countries in Europe taking aim at the United States when it comes to the Inflation Reduction Act and what that means for subsidies for U.S. companies. When it comes to the U.S. putting these sweeping curbs on semiconductors to China, you have these issues with the United States. Isn't it all the same in terms of trade policy between Trump and Biden? And she insinuated she preferred working with the Biden administration. Hey, mate, good to catch up. From Bali, Emily Wilkins down in D.C. to the both of you, fantastic, as always. Equity bulls got what they wanted in the last week. Gridlock, almost there. Downside surprise on CPI, last week got that. PPI this morning got that too. Earnings, Walmart better than expected. And throw in a big buyback into the mix as well. Walmart in the pre-market up by more than 5% going into the opening bell. Jared, I wanted to come to you on that. And I know maybe you can't touch name-specific stuff, but just give me an idea of... What do you think when you see a name like Walmart outperform the way it has done? Is that good news or bad news? It, it's, it's been said too many times already, John, but this, the, the moment you know, we're in right now is one in which I think good news really is bad news because, as, as we were discussing before, there are so many ways that the Fed can normally cause an economy to, to cool off and achieve uh, a, a stable level. Today, unfortunately, it seems that the only way that um, the Fed will achieve its, its goal is by causing some meaningful unemployment. And so easier financial conditions, if the stock market rallies, if the bond market you know, recovers, if, if companies find that their earnings are, are doing better, if retail sales remain strong, of course that's good news in the, in the broad sense. But for the standpoint of markets and also from the standpoint of short-term um, economic uh, equilibrium, you, know, you need to see, I think, unfortunately, a cooler labor market um, to, to have confidence over the next one or two years. Governor Cook speaking right now, saying she wants the Fed to have a sustainably strong labor market. Peter, is that wishful thinking? Well, you know, there's what needs to happen in the near term, and then there's what needs to happen over the long term. And it's interesting when you speak to former Fed officials, or when one does, um, and you ask them, is there a place in policy for cyclical recession? Um, it almost causes a, a short circuit of sorts. And they look at you and they sort of say, well, as policymakers, no, we never want to see a recession. But the fact of the matter is, um, you know, recessions are part of the business cycle in capitalist economies and societies. And one of the things we're dealing with right now is this hubristic um, attitude that recessions can and should be prevented at all costs by the Monetary Policy Authority. I think that's sort of folly, frankly. Um, and that leads eventually to, you know, to, 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 quote, to quote Nassim Taleb, you know, a more fragile marketplace for assets and a more fragile underlying economy. And I think that's what we're on the cusp of right now. And notwithstanding that we're talking about this with futures up two and a half plus percent. Yeah. Um, it doesn't change that. What happens when we're all expecting the same thing? Neil Dutter of Renaissance Macro shared this with me a little bit earlier this morning. I think it's important to go through it with you both. He said, recessions work through an element of surprise. What if recession has been widely expected, but growth is picking up? He went on to say at the moment, consumer spending is running 4% in 
in real terms. What would you say back to that, Jared? Well, it, it's true that consumer spending is up high, and, and uh, uh, I think the, the, the key question from an investment point of view is, is whose expectations? Because as we saw with our, the survey data earlier this morning, um, you can see in the market now, fund professionals, investment professionals have a certain set of expectations, but that's such a tiny sliver of the broader equity market and the economy as a whole. And it's the expectations, I think, across the broad economy and even across the broader investment landscape. Look at what household investors are doing, for example. They're not bearish. You haven't seen major outflows from the broad you know, swath of, of American investors this year, something that you did see before prior market lows in 2009, after the dot-com bubble, even 2015 and 16. If we, if we find a low in this market and rally to a, you know, a new bull market over the next uh, you know, five to ten years, it would be the first time in history that we would have gone through some tight conditions in a difficult period without seeing major outflows from investors. So I think the important thing to remember about expectations is whose expectations, how big a deal are they, and sometimes you know, investment professionals overstate a little bit uh, how important they are in the broader scheme of things. Pete, final word. I'm almost laughing at Jared. Final word, Pete, on that one. But you know how much you love it when I answer your questions with a question, so I'm going to do it. When is the last time you have seen a consumer look at a, a full punch bowl and go, no, 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 I, I've had enough? Happens every single time the consumer spends until there's no punch in the punch bowl. Peter Shikini, Jared Woodard, to the both of you, going into the opening bow. This was so gloomy given where equity futures are, up by 1.6% on the S&P 500. Yields are lower, the dollar's weaker. We're down five basis points at the front end. On a 10-year, we're down about five basis points as well. Euro dollar, back to 104. Euro dollar, lows of the year, end of September, 95.36. That's close to a 10% rally, just like that. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital are expecting Fed speakers to pour cold water all over markets. That conversation at the opening bell. Five minutes away from the opening bell, equities high by 1.5% on the S&P. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Jefferies initiating coverage on Harley-Davidson with an underperformed rating, saying the stock's recent rally is overdone. Bank of America resuming its coverage on Netflix with a buy, seeing a stronger outlook for international subscriber growth. And finally, Moffat Nathanson starting Amazon with an outperform rating, expecting further market share gains through 2023. That stock is up by 4.5%. Coming up, Walmart kicking off big retail results, topping estimates and boosting the outlook. More on that conversation with Joanne Feeney coming up. Equity market bulls, your Santa rally came early. What a run we saw Thursday, Friday, paused Monday, picks up again on Tuesday. Equity futures up by 1.5% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100 up by 2.5%. The catalyst for this morning, we kick higher off the back of another downside surprise on inflation in America, this time PPI last week, CPI. Let's open and bow, switch to the board and get to the bond market. Treasuries look like this, yields on a 10-year right now, down three or four basis points. We're off session lows, 381.62 on a 10-year. In the FX market, euro dollar, mentioned this briefly earlier in the hour. Cable, the pound against the US dollar, has gone from 103.50 at the end of September to about 119. Euro dollar has gone from about 95 to 104 in the same period. So we're talking about 9% moves on euro dollar and even more than that potentially on sterling. Unreal. Outside of that, crude, 85.12, we're down 9 tenths of 1%. And outside of that, there's only one stock on our radar right now. It's Walmart. And Walmart, 30 seconds into the session, is flying up more than 5%. With that story, here's Abby. Hey, John. Yeah, Walmart is flying this morning. It's best day since the spring of 2020. But it's not just Walmart. It's also Home Depot. And the reason we want to bring in Home Depot is the contrast between these two reports. Now, on the surface, Home Depot's report is okay. They beat. However, when you 
did dig beneath the surface. Unlike Walmart, their transaction prices were up about 9%, but foot traffic down 4%. That's not the right kind of detail that you want. Inventories also remain bloated up 25%. They only held the outlook, which suggests they could miss the fourth quarter. Walmart, on the other hand, strong, strong, strong. They beat earnings by double digits. Sales also beat by 3.3%. Inventory bloat was halved. And they're also talking a strong game for the holiday season that folks will probably be out shopping. One question could be that if folks are going to Walmart more so because of the price uh, being more attractive there, will it steal from other places? We don't know. But it's interesting, John, from a stock perspective, if we go into the Bloomberg terminal, it's very interesting because back in 2020, we We've seen both staples and discretionary uh, peak. The PE that we're looking at in blue, uh, that is uh, discretionary to staples coming in as, so interesting, John, what in white, real wages coming into a negative. So as Americans have less money to spend, discretionary's PE, it's still high. It's at 26 times forward, but it's coming in closer to staples. Abby, great work as always. Thank you. Walmart this year up by more than 5% on the session on the year. I'll bring you the year to date as well because compare this to the benchmark, the S&P 500 on the index, then compare the yearly performance of Walmart to what's happened with Amazon this year. Walmart's now just about positive for 2022. Amazon is down by 38%. Compare and contrast the fortunes right now. What we've heard from Walmart this morning to what you're hearing from Amazon at the moment. Amazon preparing its largest ever layoff, planning to cut 10,000 jobs. This coming after the tech giant's chairman warns of a recession coming. The economy does not look great right now. Things are slowing down. You're seeing layoffs in many, many sectors of the economy. People are, are, are slowing down. Um, the probabilities say if we're not in a recession right now, we're likely to be in one very soon. So my advice to people, whether they're small business owners or, you know, is uh, uh, take some risk off the table. Ed Ludlow joins us now on the West Coast for more. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, John. That softness in U.S. producer price is clearly the catalyst across technology as the Nasdaq 100 pushes to its highest level since mid-September. You look at Amazon and Apple, the two biggest points drivers to the upside on that index, seeing tremendous gains in both of the stocks. Amazon perhaps feeling some read-through, some feel-good from what we saw in Walmart, given that a big part of that story is higher income spenders going into Walmart stores. Ahead of the holiday period, both the weaker PPI print and also the Walmart results might bode well for Amazon in the last three months of this year. The story, according to Bloomberg sources, is 10,000 jobs to be cut uh, as soon as this week, according to sources. But context, this is less than 1% of its workforce. That chart tells the story. Higher energy and labor costs from an already bloated business really impacting Amazon, not just on the retail side, but it's AWS in the form of margin erosion in the third quarter just gone. And this is what the street has been calling for and therefore cheering as you see the stock push higher on news not just at that soft inflation print, but also on the efforts to cut prices. Apple's another one that I am keeping a close eye on, John. The story here, they're going to be offering discounts of 8 to 10% for business customers who are buying up Macs. This is a rare move, a rare promotion from Apple. It's a different lever that they can pull right in the demand side when things are difficult at this end of the year. But again, that stock higher by 3% caught up in this broad feel-good we see in the technology sector. Losing your job before Christmas just absolutely... Brutal. Ed, thank you, sir. Looking forward to the show a little bit later. Ed Ludlow from San Francisco. Joanne Feeney's got things to say. This is what she has to say. Market volatility reflects the eagerness to catch a recovery versus the fear that more rate increases must come for the Fed to control inflation. Expected dousing with a big bucket of cold water this week. Opportunities are growing, but patience will be required. Joanne joins us right now. Joanne, it's amazing because the Fed is pushing back. I heard that from Governor Waller in a massive way Sunday evening, but it's not shaping this market in a monster way in the way it used to. What do you make of how the markets responded to the Fed speak of the last couple of days? Well, you know, John, we've gotten a couple of data points that have really been encouraging. The lower CPI print, the lower PPI print than expected. Uh, the Fed clearly still has a lot more work to do, and we've seen these kind of rallies in the past uh, over the last nine months or so. And the Fed, you know, speakers have been coming out and saying, hey, wait, don't you know, don't discount the fact that we have a lot more work to do to get inflation under control. We're a very long way from that 2% target. And so, you know, my concern is people should just be aware that there's a reasonable chance that some of the Fed speakers are going to come out and say, don't, you know, don't discount the fact there's a lot more work to do to bring inflation down. We're going to have to continue to raise rates and we're going to be paying attention to the data. These are just two data points. 
there's a lot more uh, work to be done from the Fed. And so just be a little cautious uh, to expect, you know, volatility to, to continue here. Joanne, let's discuss how corporate America is handling some of these issues. We'll start with retail and then move over to big tech. The retailers that are reported so far, Home Depot, Walmart, Walmart's flying. I know you liked Target and TJX the last time we spoke. What are your thoughts on what's happening there now? Yeah, no, what we're seeing, right, is that consumers are bifurcating. We have folks at the very high end of the income scale who really aren't affected very much by gas prices, food prices, small part of their budget. But in the middle and, and lower, right, clearly they're feeling the pinch from inflation. They're still in better shape in terms of their balance sheets. And so I think, you know, one of the reasons why Walmart uh, saw the increase in foot traffic and transactions is that, you know, folks are shifting down to cheaper alternatives for retail and for food. Walmart has seen that increase in foot traffic. And I think for TJ Maxx and for Target, we're, we're likely to see the same thing. They've all done a good job of clearing out the inventories of the more discretionary products that didn't sell well, and they're you know holding more necessities. And uh, you know I think what we're going to see is you know consumers shift from higher priced alternatives down to these bargain opportunities. And uh, I think that's where Target and TJ Maxx really thrive. Plus, TJ Maxx is getting an inventory uh, on the cheap as other retailers have to offload stuff that didn't sell very well. The inventory piece of the story is massive for the inflation backdrop. It's Fed goods disinflation, and you're starting to see that in the data, and BlackRock has picked up on that theme. Goods inflation is easing as it needed to, but the labor constraints driving wage growth and core inflation persist. So the Fed is still on a path to create a recession via policy over tightening. BlackRock goes on to say, stocks aren't pricing that in. We stay underweight. Joanne, can you work with me there? Just how much work do we still need to do to bring expectations for earnings lower down and to what you know clearly that we have a significant labor shortage in this country and and that is problematic for the pressure uh, on wages and that's a contributor to inflation obviously i don't think it's necessarily the case that we have to necessarily end up in a recession but the job openings numbers are extremely high relative to folks looking for jobs and so if we just uh, see enough uh, discouragement of economic activity to reduce job openings that could take a lot of the pressure off of wages. But as you pointed out, Jonathan, the next you know, shooter drop may be further reductions in earnings expectations you know, for uh, next year. And, and that's you know, something that reflects that consumer spending power in real terms is going to decline, even though their balance sheets are pretty strong. And you know, that, that's, I, I think, the, the bigger concern now going forward. As you know, inflation numbers come off peak, the next question is, how much will earnings estimates for next year have to be reduced from where they are today. Well, let's talk about it. They've come down a lot already. BlackRock say expect zero earnings growth next year. Are you alongside them? Do you expect it to be that bad? Well, you know, John, the way we like to look at it is, is look at the individual companies and individual sectors, right? Since we build portfolios out of individual stocks for clients, we don't have to own the whole market. And so that overall expectation, you know, isn't as relevant to, you know, to our selection. What we like to do is look in areas where growth can continue. You know, look at healthcare. Uh, you know, earnings there uh, look very solid. They've actually been constrained by shortages, and those shortages are easing. So that's an area where you can still find growth. Um, but you know, in some of the places uh, in software, for example, we could see more declines. In certain areas of retail, we would expect to see more declines, especially in the sort of mid to high end high end retailers. So really, it's it's definitely a time for investors to be more selective, because overall, yes, we do agree that uh, average earnings estimates will be coming down, uh, zero overall, perhaps even negative in some areas. Joanne, let's pick one name: Amazon. A blend of two stories. The software story, cloud, and what's happening with e-commerce. Are the secular, secular growth themes that people were so bullish about behind a name like this one, are they stronger than the cyclical test this company's going through right now? Well, yeah. I mean, if you look at Amazon, clearly, you know, they had to build a massive warehouse capacity. They had to really load up on labor in order to handle the, the, the increase in demand through the pandemic. And you know, now what we're seeing is they're being pretty nimble. They're saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna offload a number of warehouses, we're gonna reduce that footprint, we're gonna scale back on the workers because we just don't need them anymore. We're seeing online sales as a percentage of total retail revert back to pre-pandemic levels. And we think that uh, overall, though, when you look at Amazon as an opportunity in your portfolio, you really also have to look at how they're gonna emerge from this with the cost cutting on the warehouse and labor side. And then uh, that's going to point to a bigger share of their earnings coming from the cloud side, from Amazon Web Services. 
And that's an area where there's still a lot of growth ahead as companies continue to shift to the cloud, as more and more internet traffic pushes the demand uh, for data handling and Amazon Web Services. So that's a, you know, they have a dominant position there. They're, it, it's profitable. Uh, and we think that's going to be a bigger share of valuation for the company going forward. So, you know, we continue to think that Amazon is a good opportunity here, provided that you have a, a long enough term view to get through this retail cycle. Stock is up this morning by 3.5%. Joanne feeling fantastic to catch up with you. The broader equity market up by 1.6% on the S&P 500 on the Nasdaq, up by more than 2.3%. Coming up on this program, FTX spreading doubt right the way throughout the crypto industry. If you're running a background check on somebody like Sam, you're not going to find anything. You know, um, you know he was uh, unblemished, if you will, prior to this incident. That conversation, I'm next. Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, former ECB president Jean-Claude Trichet. That's at 12.30 p.m. New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. If you're being shown a balance sheet that may or may not be accurate, if you're being shown income statements that may or not be accurate, that are being validated by third parties, you know, that's pretty rough. That's very hard to see through. Uh, if you're running a background check on somebody like Sam, you're not going to find anything. You know, um, you know he's uh, unblemished, if you will, prior to this incident. The dramatic collapse of FTX wiping out roughly 200 billion in crypto market value. Blockchain CEO Peter Smith weighing in on the longer term implications. I don't think the institutional bait is actually going to fade here, but I do think it'll delay you know, the Wellingtons, the T. Rowe Prices, the truly, like, enormous asset managers that you'd find in the equity space. The team coverage begins right now with Ed Ludlow on the West Coast, alongside me here in New York, Bloomberg Shinali Basak. Hey, Shinali. John, you hear what the blockchain CEO had to say, blockchain.com, but you do see now Ken Griffin also telling Bloomberg, and I'm quoting him here, FTX is an absolute travesty in the history of financial markets. People are going to lose billions of dollars, and that undermines trust in all financial markets. Now, when we look at the Chapter 11 filings as they pertain to FTX, possibly more than a million creditors here are at play. In fact, there's so many creditors that they are trying to toss out the traditional rules of contacting the creditors by physical address addresses and instead use customer email addresses. We'll know by November 18th the 50 largest creditors. There's also a more at play here as new directors are named. And SBF himself posts a series of very cryptic tweets spelling out what happened is what he is asking. He also tweets out not legal advice, not financial advice. This is all as I remember it, but my memory might be faulty in parts. Now remember, other exchange executives are also testifying. You have Binance executives and Galaxy ex executives testifying just yesterday over in Europe. Galaxy executives saying this is less of a crypto issue and more of a governance issue, while you have Binance saying that they will submit evidence in regard to their pending acquisition that they had then since stepped back from, as well as that sale of FTT tokens that had led to a lot of the demise uh, and the roll forward towards the bankruptcy. For I've FTX. got to say, given that people have lost lifetime earnings on that platform, it is shocking the attitude he's taken out on Twitter recently. Ed Ludlow, this asset class still grappling with this loss. Yeah, I mean, broadly, cryptocurrency is now rallying. Go on CRYP, CryptGo on your Bloomberg terminal. You'll see a lot of green on the screen, and particularly some of the tokens associated with FTX and Sam Brankman. Freed, including Solana, which over a 48 hour basis continues to make gains. The main piece of news driving this is Binance saying that it plans to launch a crypto recovery fund that will help otherwise strong projects in the industry that are facing a liquidity squeeze. I think what's really interesting is focus on what happened here with the FTX coat token itself. Some analysis from Bloomberg Intelligence. FTX printed 169 million new FTT tokens, about $303 million worth, on November 13th, which inflated supply to the tune of 144%. There are some strange dynamics at work here, but ultimately, this is the root of what was happening here. The other piece of news overnight is not just that Binance will submit evidence to UK lawmakers on what their talks were to buy FTX, 
but also their decision making behind selling out of the FTX token, the native token FTT. One final terminal chart, if I may, John, a sign of how quickly things changed. At the end of October, Bitcoin was less volatile than 99 percent of stocks on the S&P 500. Look at the bottom panel. Well, that changed pretty quickly. And a lot of the anxiety we've seen in markets stems from what has happened here. And I laugh because actually, to me, that is an astonishing chart, given how much we've assessed and analyzed the relationship between risk assets over the last 12 months. Hey, Ed, thank you, mate. We're going to leave it there. Shanali, I want to give you the final word. Leverage. Talk to me about leverage. Uh, one thing that was interesting that Peter Schiff had said online in response to CZ's effort to the industry bailout fund is crypto is really the first shoe to drop. You had CZ, the Binance CEO, speaking to 40,000 people on Twitter yesterday saying that he didn't really take a lot of venture capital money. This all goes to say is this draws a lot of existential questions, crypto or not crypto. Who do you take money from at what price and with what protections? Unreal. Shanali, thank you. Wonderful work. And we're going to catch up with Shanali through the week on this, of course. I want to get to the broader market about 20 minutes into the session. The equity market's higher. The S&P 500 is just, just off session highs, up by 1.35% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up by 2%. Into the bond market, yields lower, but off session lows again. So that move post PPI this morning, downside surprise on PPI, it fades a little bit. On a two-year, we're down only two basis points to 436. On a 10-year, we're down four basis points to 381. The dollar weakness sticks for now, but euro dollar gives up 104. 103.93 is where we are on euro dollar right now. On that currency pair on the session, euro dollar is just about positive still, but by six or seven tenths of one percent. Let's break down this equity market from the top, lift the lid on the index and get you some sector price action. Here's Abby with more. Hey, John. Well, that weaker dollar and yields down, well, that, of course, does have stocks up on the day, maybe off the highs, but nonetheless up 1.4 percent. And not surprisingly, all 11 S&P 500 sectors are hired. Now, the big mega cap tech sectors, those are the ones leading tech, communication services and discretionary. As you've been saying all year, yields down, tech stocks up, stocks up, but tech stocks up in a big, big way. But even materials and energy uh, are higher, too. Now, I really want to show something that's outrageous because these are big gains. But China Tech, John, over the last four days, it is up an incredible 24 percent. Well, at this point, 23 percent, but still a huge gain for four days. And this, of course, has to do with the positive developments out of China, including the uh, property save, uh, lowering the COVID zero policy, and then what seems to be a, a positive meeting between President Biden and President Xi. When we break it down further, this is helping out the chip space. We have the SOX trading higher by more than 3 percent. Some of those components, NVIDIA and AMD, up sharply on the hope, perhaps, that maybe some of the tensions between the U.S. and China around chips uh, will fade. And then there is Alibaba and JD.com. China Tech back up, Ripped. John. If you bought KWeb four days ago, you'd be up 25 percent. Wow, what a rally it's been. Abby, thank you. Not just China Tech, the Hang Seng more broadly in Hong Kong has ripped as well. The DAX could finish today in a bull market. The equity benchmark in Frankfurt, Germany. What a turnaround it's been in European markets more recently. We heard from the Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker just moments ago. We've been talking about crypto. This is what he had to say. I do not see the crypto market posing financial stability risk. He went on to say that Congress must decide which regulator oversees crypto. On the inflation backdrop, which some of you might be more interested in, Patrick Harker did a speech last week on inflation. He said, up like a rocket and down like a feather. This is what he had to say about inflation this morning. The Fed can keep inflation expectations anchored. One thing we don't talk much about and should is balance sheet policy. What's going to happen with QT? He said the balance sheet belongs on the back burner as a policy tool. Let's see if that remains on a back burner going into 2023. Coming up, more Fed speak still to come. I'll bring you the trading diary live from New York this morning. Good morning to you all. Your equity market rally resumes on the S&P 500 at 1.4 percent. This is Bloomberg. Tensions over Taiwan to come to blows or to come to any kind of conflict. Nothing's changed about our policy. We're obviously going to continue to support Taiwan's self-defense, but we still adhere to a one-China policy. So there's no reason for this. And we want to see the tensions across the strait to be solved peacefully. And no change in the status quo by force or unilaterally. And the president was very firm about that yesterday. Taking out some of the heat in the conversation between China and the United States. 
contributing to the overwhelmingly bullish theme of the last week. Things are getting better seemingly for some of you. CPI, downside surprise. PPI, downside surprise. Equities up by 1.5% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq up by more than 2%. That's the price action. Let's get you the trading diary. Coming up, the Fed Vice Chair for Supervision, Michael Barr, testifying on Capitol Hill at the top of the hour. Retail sales and a host of Fed speak coming up on Wednesday. Williams and Barr speaking once again. Plus, President Biden meeting with UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at the G20. Looking forward to that. Another round of claims on Thursday as well and more Fed speak. Fuller, Bauman, Mester, Jefferson and Kashgari all on deck. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.